Hello, everyone. Um, basically, there is a lot to cover today, so let's get right on into it. Um, I'm going to be talking about, uh, firstly, my process of how I've decolonized, well, not completely, but started the process to decolonize all of the races and um, basically anti-blackness that's been incorporated into the music pedagogy for my entire training through undergrad and uh, grad school and even ensembles I play with today. So we're going to get into that, talk about um, living and being a musician with, with uh, mental health and bipolar disorder and um, a lot of other things. So it's going to be really exciting. So yeah, let's do it. Um, I will firstly say, you know, Jesus gave me some talent looking into a camera is not one of them. So I'm going to be looking here um, and we're going to be with it. So pretty much to begin, I want to start with... Um, the history of bassoon. So I'm going to stick with bassoon for a second, but it will relate to other instruments and voice and everything. So my idea with bassoon that is the biggest issue is the idea of tone and that there is an idea of how to play the bassoon and a job that is mostly respected for bassoon players. So starting with tone, tone is rooted in white supremacy. This is where we're going to start. This is the tone of this presentation. So um, how that works is basically bassoon is played well now it's a lot of women a lot of non-binary people black east asian people of color you know so everyone is like really playing the bassoon these days um but when you study bassoon especially in conservatory you are shown a lot of musical examples and a lot of these musical examples are like sophie dershalu um sergio azzolini um and many other people like principal of berlin phil principal of um Rotterdam, you know, all of these different people, and they're all white. All of the tone um, ideas are based off of whiteness all over the world when it comes to bassoon. And it's extremely, extremely frustrating because there should not be one way to sound a bassoon. All of the people I just named do sound different, but they are what set the standard for pretty much all of the education all over the world. And it's extremely disappointing. It completely takes away from representation. It completely takes away from just diversity of sounds, also diversity of skin tone and gender. Um, and pretty much um, with that, it's, it's I've already said, but it's extremely frustrating. And another issue with that is when, at least I can talk about studying in the States, um, a lot of professors at these very big name schools are perpetuating that all the time. These are very well connected bassoonists, but they choose to only um, give examples of people that they respect. I guess I probably shouldn't use that word, but people that um, they can relate to in sound, people that they essentially think sound great. And these are teachers, you know, like at Juilliard, um, like Billy Short, um, Ken Laskowski, um, then Whitney Crockett, um, Ted Lurie, um, all of these teachers, they usually give examples. I mean, I've met all these people and been to their classes. Um, so this is why I'm saying that. And it's really, really frustrating to um, be told or heard that this is how you should sound bassoon. That the principal of New York Field, Judith Claire, will be like, this is the music on bassoon that sounds the best. And it's like, you should never, there is no hierarchy, firstly. Like, let's just cancel that, you know. Um, there is more to bassoon than playing Figaro. So what, how I've had to take that and kind of change it is I have to do my own research, you know, that's the thing when you um, are black, indigenous or a person of color, non-black uh, person of color, that you have to go and work 50 times harder um, because you have to teach yourself all of the things that your quote unquote great school is not teaching you. So the bassoonists that I have started to listen to um, are my friends and teachers um, and just other people I just really look up to like Monica Ellis, Andrew Brady, Lacolian Washington, Francesca um, Wright, Alex Davis, Dr. Meyer Stone, and Kai Rock. You know, these are people that I've played with, I've studied with, and just heard, and they each play so differently, and it's so, so beautiful. But no one really looks at them for the idea of what you could sound like on bassoon. It's kind of like, oh, they're doing well, you know, or this and that, but it's never really taken super serious. And that's extremely disgusting. And it's extremely racist and just perpetuates the foundation, growing the foundation of how white supremacy is so integrated into music pedagogy. Um, so with that, you know, students are also not encouraged to play outside of the box when it comes to playing bassoon or other wind instruments. You know, a lot of the time you go to conservatory and you're taught 
play these scales, play these etudes. Um, and yes, fundamentals. But there's other ways to teach people fundamentals. You can, at least with my students, I'm like, okay, what's your favorite song? A lot of my students are black, so they love Meg Thee Stallion, they love Cardi B, they love No Name, they love Nerd. And I'm like, okay, pick your favorite song that has a really strong beat and figure out the BPM of that and practice your scales. Okay, now practice your scales halftime with this beat. Practice subdivision, you know, pre play your scales at a triplet to WAP. You know, like see how you can do that because all of these pieces have amazing rhythm in it. Um, and a lot of the times with bassoon, it's like excerpts or die, you know? Most our bassoon concerto or put it in the case. And it just continues to create this hierarchy and basically others, all this other type of music. You can have your students play um, tangos to strengthen their rhythm. You can have your students go be in a rock ensemble to strengthen their um, rhythm. You can have them go play Afrobeat or just traditional African music, you know, with all this very strong rhythm and Caribbean music. Um, those can also be used in pedagogy, but it's just choose not to. Like it's 2020, it's time to completely, completely flip it all in its head, especially everything that's happened this year and a lot of schools curriculums are starting to now integrate um, blackness into their education. You know, it's been a long time. I guess we're here now, but um, it's, there's so, so, so many other ways to play bassoon. And also with tone, um, people don't understand with bassoon, firstly, no one's gonna sound the same because everyone's mouth is different. Your lips are different. The way your tongue is placed is different. A lot of the way people describe embouchure, tongue placement, the roof of your mouth, move your tongue this way, you know, all of these things. And it's like, it's really quantum. Like I actually can't see inside your mouth. Like I actually don't know what you're doing. Um, so it's just, it's just kind of crazy that we're still using biology so, so much to teach these instruments when it's gonna be a really personal journey. You could just say like, okay, watch out for these things and see what works for you. Experiment. You know, for me, raising my tongue here makes my intonation better, but for you, it might not because raising your tongue could cause other tension, you know? So there's so much going on that is just rooted on the white body because um, most of the people that found it, found it, but got really um, popular playing bassoon are white people. So um, there's just also such a divide in bassoon um, with sound production even more between white people. Um, you know, there is the European style of playing bassoon and then there's the American style of playing bassoon both are rooted in whiteness. Um, and it's just kind of crazy to me that there is even a divide in that. Um, of course, there's like a different intonation level, but also some American orchestras like Boston Symphony plays at 442 or 443, I'm not exactly sure. Um, and a lot of European orchestras start at 442. The New York Field plays at 442, you know? So all of these things, you could kind of argue it's intonation thing, but just playing style. And it's like, why not integrate the both? You know, um, like, Europe is the OG colonizer and all of the white people in America are usually from Europe. So it's like, I guess the baby colonizers, but you know, and it's kind of crazy that they don't see the connection between the two. Um, and that's just like really mind boggling to me that it's become such an issue, um, especially in the world of oboe. Um, I am not exactly sure where the person's from, but with LA Phil, um, there was an international oboist that won the LA Phil job and he had placed on the European style, also with Philadelphia Orchestra, and these people were about to riot. You know, and it's just like, why is this a thing? Like, why is there an American sound? Why is there this sound? You know, what, if music, as a lot of white people say, like to transcend race, you know, why are we putting these blockage um, up on something that you found it also? Like, why not challenge yourself to blend with this tone um, that you've created, you know? So all of those things really boggle my mind when it starts with bassoon. And with that, how I, with all of that said, how I've kind of taken it in my own way to really start to break apart those things for me and not letting that pressure happen, not forcing myself to listen to those things and let myself have freedom to play bassoon how I want to. You know, still gotta have stable intonation. Articulation still has to be very crisp or legato, still have to double tongue. All of these things still matter. But what you sound like when you do these things should not truly be judged, you know? As long as you, whatever ensemble you're playing in, it should still blend. But that doesn't mean assimilate, you know? There should still just be a unified sound of mixing these different tones together. 
and creating a new sound instead of making this like traditional orchestra section sound or traditional chamber group sound. You know, we can push past these things and kind of create new norms or not even make a norm, you know, just make new different decisions, new choices um, for people to choose from when they are picking out recordings and things like that. And not necessarily having one sound of a string quartet um, better than the other, you know, it should just still blend and should, should still speak to someone as long as like it's in tune and the rhythm is right, you know, people should still have freedom to like different um, styles of saying, of saying, of, um, <laughs> of playing. Um, but for me, I have um, really started to listen to a lot of different styles of music. Um, like I always have, but now incorporating it into my practice, into my pedagogy, into my students' pedagogy. Um, and with that, I've always noticed who is also not used as an example is like Solange, Nina Simone, Ari Lennox, Lauren Hill, Zena Rubinos, Nerd, Maxwell, Michael Jackson, Prince, you know, the list just, Jennifer Hudson, the list goes on and on and on. These are beautiful voices with so many different styles. You can relate any sound to your instrument. If bassoon is supposed to um, emulate the human voice, then why are we relating it to multiple styles of hu the human voice? And specifically, why are we just straight up not including black voices in anywhere in music, but especially as in pedagogy? And the answer is white supremacy, of course, but it's just like, wow, you're completely missing out on an entire different sound concept you're you're giving up on this whole palette of things and it's crazy that they don't want to include these voices and pedagogy or just musical examples in general or even give the respect but yet they're often stolen from so um with that just to pick like a couple of people i mentioned um with solange you know solange um just released when i get home well i guess two years ago now 2020 has ruin time for everyone but um with Solange I just love how legato her music is you know I just love how smooth it is but but also has a lot of minimalism um and all of these different ways and just invokes very certain emotions in me I want to listen to it and I really try to play bassoon in that way and it's like okay how smooth can I get my legato how can I make myself sound ghostly like her voice but also at the same time still have this very lively energy um and also with, um, let's go with Jennifer Hudson. That voice is humongous. It does not have an edge to it. She can keep going and going and going. And that's how she became um, Jennifer Hudson. You know, it's, it's just amazing. And so when I'm pushing my sound, I'm like, okay, girl, you still need control. We can't, we can't break the sound, you know? So those are things I have started to incorporate in myself to not um, just be a one-sided musician, to be multifaceted. I'm from Texas. I listen to country music. Um, well, not so much anymore, but I used to listen to a lot of country music when I was in high school. And it would essentially be like, okay, country music has that same theme to it. A lot of them, like you can turn it on, has the same chord structure, all these things, that don't, 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 you know? So it's like, okay, if I'm starting a piece and it's supposed to have this, um, familiar um, feeling to it, you know, how can I incorporate that? And the reason I bring up country music, rock and roll, all of these things, of course, we're talking about whiteness. So let's get into it and how all of these genres are also started by, started by black people, but were completely taken over by white people. How Elvis Presley completely took over the rock and roll scene when he didn't start it. So things like that. Um, and, you know, music created by black people has often often been seen as trashy inferior less than you know in comparison to many other styles of music but specifically classical music um so that's why in conservatory people kind of having these hip-hop ensembles and they're like ah, okay maybe you don't join that maybe you should go practice your figaro a little more maybe you should go practice your hockey that was a little messy but you know it's just completely it's disgusting it's completely disgusting how just so looked down upon in music school, almost anything created by black people really is. And you know how it's really easy to tell it's not seen as the same is because in music history, what style of music do you have to pick an elective for? And what is um, just put in the normal streamlined classes? What is put in a optional course? 
you know? So it's just, they're laying out for you that like, we're going to give you this option. We, you can do it if you want to, but we're not really about to teach this. Like we're probably, the class isn't going to get filled. Oh, well now it's canceled. You know, it's, it's just, they don't give a chance to um, teach their students of anything of our people. And if they do, they make it in this very tokenized way. They're going to pick one black composer that we're going to stick on the whole time. And it's just like, okay, bro, like challenge yourself. If you're so smart, you have this PhD from Harvard in musicology, you only know Brahms, you know, like, how does that make sense? You had all these resources. Um, cause I was speaking specifically cause I went to Peabody Conservatory, which is a part of Johns Hopkins, huge research school, lots and lots of money to research and to just really explore, um, to your heart's content. And you're telling me that these huge institutions are just, they don't have the resources to implement this into the curriculum. I think they are now because the nation is now suddenly caring about black people, but we'll see tomorrow when this election's over, if they actually still care about us. But, um, yeah. So it's just completely asinine to me that it is just so proven that black students, we have to go to the, the music history classes. We have to go to the music theory classes. We have to go to ear training. And then also if we want to learn about our music, we have to really go out and seek it ourselves. which yes, we should be learning about our music. We should have the initiative to learn about our music. It just gets difficult when you have to write this like eight page paper, go have to practice, go have to go do this rehearsal. And it's like, fuck, like, when do I do this? You know, it just really has to become kind of a secondhand thing for you, which really sucks. And you have to make it a priority in life. What you want to do, you will make a priority. So I and my friends have made it a priority that we are just researching all these different black composers. How do we program them? Who are the living black composers? Who are our friends pretty much that are writing music? Um, also, I live in Brooklyn. There's a lot of motorcycles outside my house right now or dirt bikes. We're going to go with it. So, um, and things like that. And you're just constantly forcing your black students, firstly, to let it under all this racism in the music school from security guards to the rehearsals to the microaggressions. And then you're drowning them in all this work that doesn't represent them. And then if we bring projects of black music, it's like, oh, good for you. You know, like we're never actually going to incorporate that into the curriculum, but thanks, you know, and it just really, it just, it, I hate it. I hate the fact if you want to learn about black music, you have to take an elective. It's great that we would have an entire class just to focus on our music would sign up with that, not, but, um, but also like it should be just in the curriculum, you know, Julius Eastman should be in the curriculum. George Lewis should be in the curriculum. Um, Matsuna Roberts should be in the curriculum. You know, it, 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 it's insane. It's insane that so at this point they haven't really found how our people can be incorporated into the music history curriculum. Um, so also going off of that, with how it just looks so down upon and also just like the entitlement that white musicians have, um, and control of this field. Um, it's, I think it was proven the most to me personally. Um, cause I'm 25, you know, so I started college when I was 18, um, and started seeing a lot more things that I never saw in life because where I grew, I grew up in Houston. Um, I personally didn't really go to school with any white people until I got to Peabody. Um, so there was a whole different culture that I ever got to experience and it is why my mental health was intact for most of my life. So, um, when I started getting into contemporary music, which I, you know, orchestra is very racist. Contemporary music. Oh my God. It's so much more racist because they think they're not racist. So they let so many things go. They make so many excuses for all these things. They take their time. They call their ensembles a band. It's not a band. You know, you'd pay taxes. Like it's. It's not even, it's an ensemble. It's an ensemble. And a lot of them try to differentiate themselves from orchestra. But one of the biggest things in orchestra that people complain about is the audition process. So you're telling me that you're better than an orchestra, but you only have invite only auditions. How does that make you better? How is that dismantling white supremacy? If you, if all these ensembles are based off of, um, usually people like International Contemporary Ensemble, they were all based in Oberlin conservatories historically do not have a lot of black students, indigenous students, Latinx students. So if you're only basing these ensembles off the people, you know, it's going to be pretty white. And then if you just keep moving forward and the ensemble stays the same for all of this time, it's still probably going to be really white. So then if you start inviting people and your whole circle is white, 
he probably only invited white people. You know, so what's different here? Um, but also going with that, just a lot of composers, a lot of musicians just feel like they're left out or they're other. And it's like, you're still white. You still get a lot of respect for your music. Like, let's let's take a step back here. So what happened in 2018, I'm sure we all remember, was when Kendrick Lamar won the Pulitzer um, for Damn. Amazing, amazing piece of work. Um, and it was just so incredible for the first time um, hip hop was integrated into the Pulitzer. Now, there's two sides to look at this. You know, it's like, okay, if we're trying to separate ourselves from white supremacy, why are we going for these pretty white led um, titles and affirmations and things like that? And it's like, yes, we should not seek white approval, but white people have the bag. And for the white people in this room that don't know what I'm talking about, the bag equals money. We need money. Rent, I could not live in this apartment in Brooklyn if I did not have a paycheck. So um, you still need not the approval, but we just need the financial support that these institutions have. So um, with that, there's a quote. Well, I saw, when I logged on to Facebook, I saw mostly very positive things. And then I saw a couple white composers um, personally on my Facebook that were kind of trashing it. And I was like, what? And then I saw this very long um, Facebook post that had this quote in it. Um, and it said, good for him but I'm not sharing all of your cheers. The Pulitzer Prize is one of the very few areas where contemporary classical music actually enters into the public sphere. If what has happened with the Kennedy Center honors is any indication that the Pulitzer um, is following the trend. And it's like, firstly, um, is there something wrong with including black people and black art into this? Also, let's break down contemporary music. Contemporary music isn't just like, okay, I'm gonna have my bassoon, I'm gonna throw a toaster out the window, and I'm gonna twerk on my head in the back. You know, that is not just what new music has to be. Um, it also can just be music of our time. It's why Solange is a contemporary musician. It's why R. Lennox is a contemporary musician. Um, contemporary music just means music that is created today, including Kendrick Lamar. So it's just all of this entitlement of just like, this is our space, this is that, this is that. It's completely gatekeeping. And it looks like that's why a lot of contemporary ensembles, a lot of orchestras, a lot of arts organizations, if you put the Ku Klux Klan, if you put a Trump rally and you put, honestly, international contemporary ensemble right in the middle, what looks different? What looks, maybe the clothes, maybe there are some more baggy pants, maybe there's some camo. But if you look across the board, uh, it's not, there's not a lot different going over there. So, um, and just in contemporary music, there's just so, 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 so much entitlement. Um, and then when a black person speaks out, it's like, oh, we need to change. But we don't actually change. And it just really proves that even any art that comes out of our mouth or that we just produce out of our bodies, out of our fingertips, out of our soul, it's still just looked as not as good. You know, I have seen people I know that have doctorates, that have one orchestra jobs and this like that, and they completely are still put and compare it to their white counterparts. You know, it's, I just remember personally, um, I met this composer through another friend and they were introducing, this other friend was also a bassoonist. They were introdu introducing me to these two supporters of new music. And they said, I'm not gonna say the same, but they said I was um, X and X level good. And I remember being like, no, I'm Clifton Gidry level good. <laughs> you know, like don't compare me to him. He does different things than me. I do different things to him. We both play contemporary music and we both play bassoon, but don't compare me to him. And especially don't compare me to a white person, you know? So it just is so messed up and all in all the areas. And you should, firstly, should not compare people to people because we all are on our own journeys in music, but especially don't do that. So um, a big thing that is really um, looked down upon is different fields in music. If you decide to go do contemporary music, you are often seen as someone who can't, just can't make an orchestra, doesn't have the discipline. Um, if you wanna go do early music, you're seen as you can't play in tune. Um, you want the easy way out. And if we really look at this, um, there's a lot of orchestra pieces, excerpts that are quite hard um, to execute. But if you look at actually learning the pedagogy of it, Ravel Piano Concerto is a scale study. Um, Scheherazade is a melody on B minor. You know, Bolero is just a rhythm exercise in the high range and practicing that. There are some contemporary pieces that I have had to take out a ruler, a calculator. You know, there is just, there's math happening. It is very, very hard. Um, also microtones, you have to play a microtone. So that you have to know where zero is to go play a 35 above that. 
Um, also with early music, you have to know where 440 is to actually play at 415 and then stay at 415. Cause if you know about the broke um, violin, you have to retune that motherfucker all the time. Oh, the lute, the harpsichord, you know, like it's so much work that is seen as getting out of things. But I don't know, it seems kind of the opposite. If you're playing the same music every season and at this point you kind of have Mahler one memorized. So who is really challenging who um, during all of this? And another thing that is really looked down upon is um, musicians that do studio recordings, go play with R&B artists, do um, film, go play for films and all of these things, or just solo do, they were classically trained, but they also do jazz improvisation or improv um, pretty much with also the artists mentioned above. And the person that I've personally met that has completely inspired me to, um, just do what I want to take bassoon in the direction that I want to is Caitlin Edwards. You know, she's a violinist. She is from Alabama. She currently lives in Chicago. You all should hire her amazing violinist. But when we first met um, in Kenya, because we were playing um, with the dance center, Kenya um, ballet orchestra. Um, I think soon after that, she got called to play Lion King and we're the same age. And I was like, bitch go off. And then more things just started following and following her while she also, um, was playing many other classical pieces and recitals and things like that. And she just integrates so many different of styles of music into her life. And she still practices her scales. You know, she still practices her articulation um, and her bow hold and all of these things. And it's just like, Caitlin is working extremely hard. She's working way harder because she is challenging herself in these many different styles of playing and just having to be on. When that recording light comes on, you have to just play. Um, if you're improv with an artist, especially R&B, you know, a lot of us aren't taught that in school. That's a whole 50 different skills right there, you know? And it's insane that it's just truly looked down upon um, when you don't wanna go play in the Boston Symphony, if you don't wanna go play in American Ballet Theater Orchestra, when also the road to get to those places are significantly just many, many, many barriers for people that look like me, uh, for people that are Latinx, you know, for people that are indigenous. A lot of us can't afford to go to pre-college because of institutional racism, because of systematic racism, because of food deserts, because of um, the prison industrial system, you know, a lot, there's a lot of reasons black and brown indigenous people are low income. And it's not because we don't work hard, it's because the government doesn't want to fund us. They don't want us to have good lives. And it's very clear because look at Flint, Michigan, still doesn't have clean water. So um, the road to getting to Juilliard for someone that looks like me, from someone who is white, are very different, very, very different. And um, generational wealth, you know? I know for bassoon, it was kind of a joke between me and my friends of just how like, you have to buy a heckle bassoon. Usually those hoes cost close to a lot of times $40,000, probably minimum 32. And a lot of um, the white people I met that play bassoon, literally their great aunt or uncle will die and there's suddenly $50,000 for them and they go get a heckle. That was just not my situation in any way, shape or form. A lot of us have to go into debt to buy a bassoon um, or a oboe or a violin, you know, all of these different things. But all of these orchestras are like, we need to add diversity, but black people aren't showing up to audition. Well, we had to jump over 50, 50 um, hurdles, climb a mountain, do this and that. And it's just like, you think this is an even playing field? Then they start to incorporate these diversity initiatives, but still the beginning is still not there. You know, so some programs have the beginning, but then once you're in high school, they kind of start to drop off. And then when you get to college, um, they're like, okay, we got you into, into Juilliard. Okay, now deal with this whole other level of racism that you've never to deal with before pretty much. And we're kind of just gonna let you go to God. We hope you get the job, we've done our job. You know, and it's like, there's just so many gaps and it's just so, so colonized to think that everyone has the same opportunities as you. Um, to think everyone has the same financial abilities as you because music is really based in capitalism. Um, so it's just, it's extremely frustrating to see um, people get praised for winning a job when their parents are also musicians, orchestra musicians, when a lot of my friends come from single parent homes whose parents really didn't have the education to really support, um, to really understand music. So our parents had to work a job and then come home and work another job and figure out what the hell we're trying to do with our lives. Um, and just be a parent and be a person, um, trying to figure out how to get us into camps, how to figure out how to do this, having to just learn about this whole new system 
while still not really having any money to do this, you know? So having to go do a bake sale, have to have a fish fry, host a barbecue to raise all this money. And then when we get there, we're so exhausted because we had to physically practice to get in. You have to practice while the world is showing you how your black life or indigenous life or Latinx life doesn't matter by having to watch um, black people be murdered, um, indigenous people having their land taken away and also be murdered having many, many Latinx children um, locked in cages at the border and also just stolen from their families and now lost, you know, um, and also just dying basically in captivity. And you have to take all of this stress, all this um, mm, intergenerational trauma and still go wake up and play scales and sit next to people in orchestras that are extremely racist to you. So, you know, there's so many things going on um, at home and the government, just in the country in general, and we're still expected to just perform, perform, perform. Um, and none of these things are just taken into context, which is just such a problem with um, how the music system is placed um, and pedagogy expectations and all of these things. And it's like, can we take a break? You know, like, can we just really look at the reality situation? If someone beat me in audition, um, that was just meant to be. We're not going to have hard feelings about that unless it was rooted in racism or something. But I tried to beat myself up because it's like, okay, I woke up on the way to the audition. Um, I was probably called a slur on the way there or experienced some microaggression. So I'm angry. I'm distracted. I get into the building checking for the audition. And they're like, wait, are you really here for this? And you know, it's like, can we just, there's a whole bassoon on my back. I, I think we can just um, continue forward. And you have to say focus through all these things when a lot of times, um, a lot of white people that go to an audition, you know, they walk in, they might have a bassoon on their back and they just assume they're supposed to be there. They're talked to in a, in a completely different way and all of these things. So in many, many different aspects in music, there's just so much white supremacy just completely, completely rooted um, in all of it. And it's just such a problem when it comes to pedagogy, when it comes to the systematic structure of music education, when it comes to accessibility. Um, when it comes to hiring processes of orchestras and also teachers at schools, the whole tenure process in a university and an orchestra, what is, you know? So it's just kind of a mess. Um, but getting more into ways to really structure pedagogy, um, you can use a lot of different styles of music again to show, show examples to your students on um, ways to play rhythm, to articulate, to have a really legato sound. Um, how to be extremely full without pushing all the things I kind of mentioned before. So I'm going to start playing um, some musical examples that I believe could really be integrated into teaching your children um, or teaching your students in general, um, better rhythm, better articulation, better, um, just more ideas of tone production and all of these things and just flow. So the first, um, let me do this little share. The first um, song that I have is like a really big song of, song of this summer um, and every time I listen to it I'm just like wow Meg Thee Stallion is really that girl like the way she can just completely be on top of the beat not rushing just in that pocket you know um, still being so strong but nothing she does is clipped it doesn't sound just it, it just sounds good good you know and that's just what I aspire to do when I'm playing something that has a lot of articulation, I don't want it to sound forced. I don't want it to sound like I am struggling. Like she completely owns this. So um, I'm going to play a little bit of this. Gobble me, swallow me, drip down the side of me, quick yeah. jump out for you, let it get inside of me. I tell them where to put it, never tell them where I'm about to be. I run down on them before I have a nigga running me. Talk your shit, fight your lip, ask for a call while you ride that dick. You really ain't never got him fucking for a thing. He already made his mind up before he came. Now get your boots, hang your coat, fuck this wet ass pussy. He bought a phone just for pictures of this wet ass pussy. Pay my two... So with that example, things that I love about it is that it would show my students, okay, you are riding this wave. You control the wave. You know, you were leading the ensemble. Also, you have to prepare to subdivide to go straight into halftime and not lose a beat to kind of also change the tone quality to get a little softer, um, to get a little more legato. So those are things I learned from that, um, from that song. Um, that I think can really be talked about. But a lot of the times people try to steer away from this music when they're teaching, because again, it's seen as inferior. It's seen as too aggressive. It's too raunchy. It's gangster shit, you know? And it's just like, let's stop that shit. That is all rooted in anti-blackness. A lot of time when people tell me they don't like hip hop, especially if they're white, I'm like, uh, that's 
probably rooted in racism, you know? Um, so yes. So that is the first musical example I have. The second is um, a song by Ari Lennox called Broke featuring J.I.D. And with this one, I really noticed how also accuracy of rhythm and how it is um, very also in the pocket, um, the section sung by J.I.D. And it's just so legato. It has so much space. Um, he is also really controlling the time, but really also not rushing, but also not dragging, just also really in the pocket. Um, so there is this one. Fight, but I'm mm, not that. Only you, it ain't really all about money to me. Chilling if you're trying to find sun, do sitting there looking like sun. E, I've been broken, you've been broke, your heart been broken, I'm still broken, breaking down. We, I've been hoping, you've been hopeless. Help me, please, heaven, notice me and my the focus. Somebody show me the rope of dough so I could dodge your demons. Trying to choke my throat. Her last man was litty, he had loads of dough. He was taller, older. I'm like Amendola. High trips left, open, right. Call me over. So in that song, there are many different time changes. There's many different um, style changes in there, and they're so seamless. Of course, you know, it's a studio recording. Who knows if that was all in one take, but I'm sure it could have been. And when you're playing a contemporary piece or an orchestra piece with all of these different um, tempo changes, different time changes, and a lot of them can be like, oh, okay, okay, let me do that. But I really would want myself to glide straight through that. Um, also, just another piece that isn't really looked at so high because um, it's either just not known um, because a lot of um, conservatives don't push you to explore R&B music, to explore hip hop, even explore jazz. Um, you would never really know about that, which is just a damn shame. Um, also, with this next um, piece written by Julius Eastman, Stay On It, um, it just invo invokes so much joy. And I've heard that used before in a lesson or a masterclass. And it's like, listen to, like, you know, think of the second movement of Mahler 1. It's just very like, oh, yes, um, that's what you should feel here. And it's like, uh, okay, I mean, yes, I agree. But is that the only example you can give me? Um, so also it really shows how an ensemble can just be so in unison um, with style, with articulation um, and just feeling throughout. And it also just lets you explore many different tone colors and see how you can really fit in a chord. Cause with this piece, there's four different lines, um, four different harmonies, and you can really just kind of jump around and it kind of teaches you like, oh, okay, how can I blend here? Okay, if I'm playing lower, how do I not let myself play louder um, while doing that? So with that. So every time I hear that song, I get so happy. I really do. Um, and with that, it's kind of, we're gonna take this a second to go back to what I was talking about earlier of lack of representation in musicology. Um, Julius Eastman was a very forgotten about composer. He went to Curtis Institute um, and then he moved to Ithaca to study more on like a post-grad fellowship. And he also had bipolar disorder, which is what I also have. And I never heard of this man until I went to to study at BAMP in 2018 and George Lewis talked about him a lot. Um, and I was like, who is this person? Um, so I remember looking him up and be like, oh my God, he looks like me. You know, he's also black. And I read about his story about how he um, had a really tragic life and a really hard life and he ended up dying in the village where I went to grad school at Manus. He died pretty close to that school. Um, and with that, we premiered his second symphony in Alice Tully Hall at the Man School of Music in October of 2018. Um, and they asked me to give like the speech about him because tokenism. But um, I just noticed throughout the entire rehearsal process, the amount of disrespect he was given, the amount people were just not actually trying to learn 
um, about him. They just saw like, oh, this piece is all whole notes. Oh, there's just nothing interesting about it. And I'm like, okay, he wrote a bunch of whole notes. Do you practice your long tones? Because what I'm hearing over there is that you cannot sustain your pitch throughout this whole thing. There's a lot of decrescendos. There's a lot of coming from Niente, a little hairpin coming down. I heard 14 different intonations happen over there. Why can't you match? Okay, there's two English horns playing and they're a soloist and they're in the middle of the orchestra. Why can't I hear them over you? Why do you think that your whole note is more important than the two soloists? There is so much to learn from all types of music, but most of those people's comments were rooted in white supremacy and anti-blackness yet again. So my last example is near and dear to my heart. <laughs> being from Houston, being from that dirty South, um, there is a song out there that resonates with all black people all over the world. Um, talking about invoking emotion and also really captivating a room. I hear that a lot. Um, and also they usually often, hmm, Revo Piano Concerto, Martha Angerich, you know, playing Revo Piano Concerto is amazing. Um, someone else playing rock too. There's like, like, oh, they just captivate from the first chord and things like that. Well, this song will captivate a lot of people, you know, um, you hear this in a party and people start running. There can be people in the kitchen, in the bathroom, upstairs, in the garage, down the street. You hear this opening beat and you're like, fuck, it's time to go. You know, like it's just time to do it. So, um, this is the last. Um, musical example I have. Girl, you're working with the man, say, the bad day, make a nigga spend his cash, say, his last day, holds fire when you pass, say, the mad day, you can ride in the jagged, with that day, you can smoke a fire bag, a Got money, y'all can pass it and trash it. I'm a big time, a nigga, yeah. Pull the trigger, yeah. I play a hit of flipper, yeah. Great filler, yeah. I'm a slick. So, yeah, there has never been a time I haven't heard that song. I've heard it a million times that a whole room just doesn't go silent. Um, that in that next moment after silence, people are like, oh, fuck, like, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. Um, and when the beat drops, like, everyone just knows what to do, you know, and I love that. And I really try to incorporate that, especially if I'm playing something really, really abstract. Um, it's like, okay, I still need to captivate and people still need to not necessarily jive with it, but really understand what I'm doing and understand that, like, I am in control of the space right now. Um, I'm going to give you this musical offering. And I really feel that with Back That Ass Up by Juvenile. Um, he is really giving us a, a song that will be timeless forever. My great, 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 great grandkids are still going to hear this and bounce that ass, you know? So that's what I um, really, truly believe that we can start incorporating into musicology. Now, the other side of that, that doesn't mean, white people, that you should start overanalyzing and breaking down the theory and harmony behind all these pieces. Because you're essentially looking for errors in the music. Um, and that is not comfortable. I don't even feel comfortable when they're doing that to like list. You know, list said, said what he said. If he used a parallel fit um, or just had an extreme octave because his hands were as big as my dreams, you know. So it just, he could do that. So I just don't really, what are we really proving here? Like, why can't we just study it and be like, oh, this is how he did this. Instead of like, this was wrong. Well, why do you get to decide that? So um, with that, jumping into the next section of also with tone production, different musical styles. I will also say I definitely will not be done by five o'clock. This is definitely gonna run over. Um, but no orchestral orchestral instrument only should sound like how they do in track for it. There is many, many, many different voices in the bassoon. And I've had to kind of pull them out myself, but there's many composers um, that some are in, in this virtual space um, that we should be listening to because they also use these instruments in such, such a different way. They really challenge you to break out of that mold of playing the second movement of Mozart Bassoon Concerto. And these composers, I've met personally and worked with them, love them extremely, um, oh Lord, dearly. And you'll get to hear them, some of them on my recital on Monday. But the composers that I feel that really take specifically bassoon, but I've heard many other instruments, um, out of the Western context, or even just the music out of the Western context, or like George Lewis, Matana Roberts, Lisa E. Harris, Nick Dunstan, Julius Eastman, um, Jesse Cox, Edgar Guzman, and Olivia Short. Um, these are just amazing, ridiculous, fucking ridiculous composers that are often just not looked at as highly. There's a lot of times that a Black composer could have an entire Pulitzer 
could have a Guggenheim and they'll still attach the title of um, rising artist, emerging composer. When these people are like 40. No, they're not emerging. You just heard about them. They've been here the whole time. So um, those are just pretty much all of the things in music that I believe we need to break down and also start to integrate more into um, the arts and also just music pedagogy. It's so, so important to break apart the anti-blackness, the institutionalized racism, the level of capitalism that is in, really integrated into music schools, but also the music industry, specifically classical and contemporary. <clears throat> so um, moving on to the complete next section of this is really talking about um, my personal practice and decolonizing in a different way. So with that, I really try not to beat myself up for not being productive. Also, what does productive mean? Give me one second. Have to hydrate out here. Um, and just letting myself rest. Grind culture is also rooted in capitalism, which is rooted in white supremacy. So, um, and just remembering that there are 24 hours in a day. If I wake up and I want to watch Great um, British Bake Off because there's an election going on and it's stressing me the fuck out, I don't have to force myself to do a form of escapism that does not serve me. It does not make me happy in this moment. <clears throat> so if it's seven o'clock and I have energy now, I'm going to probably put an hour or two in because now I can focus. Um, but also going on the other side of that, we don't have the same 24 hours. And that's used a lot in schools, really training programs, any kind of job. Um, and it's really, really toxic to make people believe that because people have work, mental health issues, childcare they have to figure out, or just raising their child while they're juggling all these different things and personal struggles. Um, and people are a lot taught a lot that you are in competition with everyone. And the whole phrase of like, if you're not practicing, someone else is working harder than you right now. So go practice. And it's like, what the fuck, bro? Like, can I rest please? I'm really tired. So, um, when you're actually just in competition with yourself, throughout most practices in life, if you are constantly comparing yourself to other people or trying to do what this person wants to do or this one person wants to do, what can you do? You don't know what you can do because you've been looking at other people. And it's hard to judge someone for that because that is just how the system has been in place. That's what we are trained with these mindsets in conservatory. And that's why people are stressed out, um, really develop some disorders in conservatory because it's just this stressful, very toxic environment that people don't get to rest. <coughs> so going with that, also, what professionalism is really extended straight from white supremacy. Also, it's really ingrained into capitalism, but mostly it's really integrated in assimilation. It's very inaccessible. It's why code switching is essentially here. Code switching is like, essentially like I'm talking like this and you know, I've been saying like bitch ho, like all this kind of shit. And when I go to work or school, it's really kind of just ingrained to me to be like, hello, like, how are you? Um, yeah, how have you been doing today? You want to get some bubble tea? You know, and it's so ingrained because it's kind of had a way, it's a survival technique. And it's a way that we have really, by we, I mean black, indigenous, people of color, but uh, specifically black people, we have been taught to have to do this to get a job, to assimilate to whiteness, the white voice, the calm, not being aggressive. Because I talk like this and it's kind of loud. If I'm in a room with other black um, people and we're talking like this, people think we're about to fight or some shit like that. So it is just really shitty that we've had to literally learn how to do this um to survive literally survive if you are being confronted by the police you have to talk like this and it's like hello officer like what's the problem like i'm so sorry was i speeding and they still probably will murder me or people that look like me so um it's inaccessible professionalism is inaccessible in a way because it also um determines hairstyle it determines the way you dress um firstly everyone's hair is professional unless you're a white person with dreads cut that shit off we're not doing that that's appropriation um or cornrows or any black protective style is not for you your hair will fall out that is just a general warning um and it's inaccessible in a way of like you have to wear a suit you have to wear a vest women have to wear this this and that and it's just like who can afford that a lot of times if you get a job you have to like afford this uniform or go afford some suit and shoes. And it's like, are you giving me a stipend to do that? Like who is paying for this shit? So it is just such an issue. Also, people with professionalism do not allow people to wear gender affirming clothes um, or even traditional garments. It's just like, you just have to assimilate to the structure of the gender binary. You have to assimilate to whiteness in every, just in every possible way, really. And it's really, really fucked up. So what I, um, have learned and was just super, super inspired by was by Katie Brown and Delaney Harris from the Classically Black podcast, 
we hosted them at the Manhattan School of Music um, about, I think a month ago now. And we were talking about AVE and Katie said something that I was like, oh shit, like, I don't know how that never came up for me. And the way that she said, um, I've essentially stopped code switching because I feel like I can explain things better when I'm not trying to speak a different language. And she says in studio class and shit that she just talks how she talks and things can get clear. It's kind of, it's not completely the same, but you're kind of translating. And I've heard a lot from my friends that are bilingual um, who say, um, they, they hear something and they're like actively translating in their head and sometimes get confused, you know, all of these things. And it's just so frustrating that you have to do that and assimilate to just speak this way. Because sometimes if someone doesn't speak the same language as you, um, that has happened before in ensembles I've played in or some orchestras or a pianist. And it's like, okay, we may not speak the same language, but if I play something and it's like, I play a little faster, I, I probably want to Rondo. Or if I draw a picture, pictures are universal. You know, that's why signs exist. If it's a circle, with a red slash in between it, it probably means don't enter um, or look ahead or something like that. If it's a yellow triangle, it usually means yield, probably all over the world. So um, I really, really was inspired by her saying that. I was like, I need to do that. So I started doing it. Um, And with that said, you know, also plug, go check out the Classically Black podcast. You can find them on Instagram, on um, I think Spotify, definitely Apple um, podcast. And they have a new website, classicallyblackpodcast.com. Um, so definitely go check them out. Also book them and pay them. Um, so with that, also jumping into something I love to talk about a lot, and it's a paper I've been working on for a long time. It's called The Wagon Does Not Exist. It kind of goes back to not beating myself up. The, there is no wagon. The wagon essentially when people say, um, I have to get back on the wagon, I fell off. It's just that simple. So with that, it's essentially saying, oh, I didn't practice for a week or a month. Now I have to practice 20 hours out of the 24 hours of, that we have in a day. Because I need to get back on it. I need to do this. I, I have to build my progress back up. And it's kind of like, okay, you may have made some really good progress for these six months and you took a week off. Guess what, girl? Like, that's not going to go away. Because you haven't just playing your instrument for six months. You've been playing it for years. If you're my age, you've been probably playing for like close to anywhere from 20 to 10 years. So it just really teaches you that it's also just rooted in so much capitalism that you feel like you can't take a break because you have to work, you have to work, you have to grind, you have to grind or you can't pay bills. And it just really sucks that way because music is such a beautiful thing. And it's just like, okay, you have to force yourself, get stressed out. And now like you're having terrible performances because you're completely exhausted. You skipped the meals because you need to go learn the Shostakovich concerto, you know? Um, and it really sucks. You have to go make all these reads, you know? Um, and it's essentially, exactly, a week break doesn't erase a decade of practice. Um, you need to take breaks and also going back with that same quote, someone is always practicing when you're not, so you're missing out. And it's just like, why just still, why would you tell someone that, um, you just don't know what people are going through. So people take breaks, absolutely just take breaks. It's okay. Especially in 2020, there is so much trauma that we are all experiencing, especially black people, indigenous people and non-black people of color. We all experience some trauma right now. We're experiencing trauma waiting for goddamn Nevada to figure out what the fuck is going on over there. So, you know, it is just, it, there's a lot of trauma going on today, um, especially, but especially this year and especially generational trauma. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about is being a musician with bipolar disorder. Um, and how I've had to completely break apart pretty much everything I was taught um, about playing the bassoon and not necessarily playing bassoon, but um, listening to my body more, giving myself breaks and how I practice bassoon. So essentially with bipolar disorder, um, you have a, I have type two. So I have a very big high that could last from, for me, like three to four days where I am on the biggest sugar high I've ever had in my life. Um, or... Um, I'm in a very, very extremely deep depression where I'm debilitated and I'm not getting in my bed. And people look at me and they're like, are you okay? And I'm like, no, I'm not. Thank you though. Um, and with that, it's hard to practice between both of those things. Um, and you can kind of tell when it's coming because sometimes you have like this, how people with seizures have like an aura. You can kind of feel something similar like that um, where it's something in your stomach and you're like, ooh, I'm about to really be manic. Or my friends have gotten to know the point now if I'm, I usually talk like this, pretty chilled out. But if I'm like, hey girl, like, what are you doing? Like, how is this? How are you? You know, they're like, okay, Joey's in the episode, you know? And it's people have given me that freedom um, to really try to grab a hold of something that I probably will never have complete control of. 
Um, so with that in the music industry, it's really in education, you're not really seen as like disabled. So you don't really get any accommodations with that. And if you're debilitated and barely can get out of your bed, cause you're thinking about keeping yourself alive and trying to eat. Um, how do you expect a, a student to go to class? How do you even expect someone to get out of their house? You know, people don't truly understand or have sympathy for this. Cause a lot of people still think mental health doesn't re reflect your physical health. So um, with that, I personally just give myself space and I've told teachers like, look, I can come to your class and sit here, but guess what? I'm still not learning shit. You know, like what is the point? You just want to see me. You want to see me staring at you. You know what? We're not getting anywhere with this. Um, so I've learned to also just give myself different practice schedules. I've had to learn to sometimes fit a lot of music into a very short amount of time because I have had a really rough couple weeks or something like that. So essentially, if it's 9 p.m., I live in a place where I can practice pretty much any time of the day, uh, which is a blessing. But if it's 9 p.m., I'm like, okay, it's here. I'm not manic. I'm really focused. Go give me 30 minutes to an hour on this and really focus, really, really just focus. And sometimes you can really learn a whole piece that way. Um, I don't encourage everyone to do that. If you have time to practice, please use the time you have. But doing that and then also if I'm practicing and I notice I'm really manic, I'm not going to keep going because I'm going to just ingrain bad mistakes. I'm not actually paying attention. I low key think I sound lit and I listen to a recording. And I'm like, bitch, what the fuck was that? You know, it's just, it's difficult. You have to give yourself space. You're dealing with something that you don't actually know what it is. Bipolar disorder really evolves with time. It has gotten worse since 2017 when I found out, but also medication has helped me dramatically. Um, so with that, I have to also give myself space for forgiveness. If I miss an opportunity for something that's in my brain that I did not control, it just kind of go in my life. Well, fuck, like I'm not going to beat myself up for that. I'm going to actually enjoy it more. I'm going to try to find the moments where like are kind of funny. Like it's a big joke with people with bipolar disorder. You can always find them organizing their closet at 2 a.m. And you know, like probably shouldn't say that, but it's actually very accurate. Um, my friends have called me and it's really late. They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm organizing my shoes, you know, or I took apart my whole dresser. I just want to move it over here. Um, those are just very common things. So I give myself forgiveness if like I'm practicing, but like I need to go clean the kitchen right now. Like I have to, or I, I cannot go to sleep. I can't have clothes on my floor. I have to pick them all up. It has to be very neat in my room all the time. So um, I've just learned these things about myself and I've had to adapt it to music. So a big dream of mine is to get um, mental health better in schools to get students true accommodation because if they're arrested, they're probably gonna play better and not have um, just stress in general with those things. So it's a lot of these things that can really be incorporated into music that are really important. Uh, the last thing I would say mostly is that you don't have to continue in school. Um, you do not have to continue going into debt or stressing yourself out because you feel like the quote unquote real world, whatever they want to call it, is too scary. So you feel like, oh, I have to get this degree. I have to get this degree. And it's like sometimes we like you just need risk. And with that, I would say that like I started at Manhattan School of Music this fall. I was really excited. Um, I really want to stay in New York. Going to Manus was really great for me. And I got into their contemporary program. I was super excited. Had a teacher of my dreams. And I've had like good success these last um, couple months. So I was like, okay, I'm actually really, really busy now. So it was a tough decision, but I actually decided to drop out of grad school, just completely withdraw, not going back, taking a year or two off and I'm gonna just have this gap year, try new things. And it's just, I'm really happy for that because I, I'm also really happy and blessed for the friends I've had to support me with that. Um, but it's just teaching myself, like you do not have to entrench yourself in this very white structure education where they're not gonna cater to you. There um, are many, many things going on with black people right now. And the school is still expecting me to show up to this rehearsal today. And it's like, no. I need to rest. I am physically exhausted right now. Like there is just no way this is happening. Um, so I have just really had to um, learn these things about myself and you have to learn to give things that serve you, which goes into this last part of radical self-love and music. You have to be honest with yourself. Self-love or self-care people say like, oh, you have to stay in bed when you stay in bed. Give yourself some orange juice if you want to do orange juice. That is true. But um, you also have to look at the big picture sometimes and think like, okay, I just brushed my teeth. If I drink this orange juice, I might throw up. So um, how that relates to music is pretty much like, okay, I have bipolar disorder. This bitch ain't going nowhere. So what do I need to do to make sure my life is just not stressful? So when I do need to rest or if I am in an episode, like my life isn't ruined and I can still get the bag is I do not show up unprepared. 
I practice my ass off when I can practice. You know, like you have to set yourself up for success um, or you will fail because you already have something in your head that wants you to fail. The system wants you to fail. You know, everyone wants you to fail essentially, except for your inner circle and your community. But um, those are things that I've had to learn about myself and just really give myself the space to also really stand up for myself. If someone is kind of... Um, trying to pressure me into doing things in music that I know I'm not comfortable with, or if I know I'm kind of in an episode and they're like, can you show up here? Or can you do this? Learning to say no. Um, learning to have, having to learn how to problem solve and like, unfortunately stay calm. Um, and all of these things I have to learn so many other skills because I have this disorder that makes my life quite difficult. Um, which also goes into, there's no such thing as high functioning because just if, in front of you, it looks like I'm doing all the shit. I'm in my bed crying at 2am, you know, and it's just the nature of the thing. You have to cover this all up during the day and it's extremely difficult all the time. And sometimes the bitch just needs to go to sleep. So, um, so in order for me to just go to sleep and not ruin my life, um, I just completely try to handle everything that happens. And that's what I tell my students who also experience mental health issues or have trauma or grief, firstly, direct them straight to therapy. Um, but secondly, it's just like, let's do everything possible to set you up for success. So let's make a plan on how you can practice even 30 minutes a day and still get some really good things done. And also accommodating to them. If they're in an episode or something or just going through something tough at home, I'm not about to keep assigning you 50, well, not really, but I assign like two eight twos a week. And if that, I'm like, how about let's, the goal is one eight two. If you learn half the etude and it's bomb as fuck, you, that is amazing. That showed me, you know how to time manage. You know how to be honest with yourself. You know how to protect your boundaries. And that's going to lead to a pretty good life, I would say. So um, it's really, I've just learned a lot from all of these things. Um, and essentially with everything that's going on in the world right now, I would say what everyone can do, um, specifically the white people in this room and non-black people of color, um, a lot of people did the Black Lives Matter Square on, um, I think in June, it was like a Tuesday, Blackout Tuesday. That didn't mean shit. Sharing everything on your Instagram, awesome. But if you don't put your money where your mouth is, literally pay reparations, literally go fund grassroots organizations, grassroots activism. You, but you go to protest and put a picture on Instagram and be like, hashtag BLM. Don't put a picture. No one has to know you were there. Um, do the, just do, move in silence. Move in silence. Let people, the way to let people know you're a part of a movement of protecting black people, also black musicians, black artists, just be there, shut up and listen, or speak up when you see someone being treated badly, specifically a black person, black queer, black trans people, indigenous people, Latinx people, you know, people that speak a foreign language and they're getting yelled at by some white person. So um, all of these things are just so, so important, especially in the world and, and also in music, correct yourselves. If you see these arts organizations that were putting out all these statements that were very rushed and very terrible, um, specifically eight black birds, that shit was terrible. Go look at it as an example of what not to do. Um, but yeah, just really speak out against these things. If you see things happening in a rehearsal, a lot of times if you're white and you speak up, guess who's not probably gonna be fired. If I speak up, guess who's gonna be right out the door. So, you know, all of these things, you really have to stand up because the big thing right now, that everyone I know that looks like me um, or the person of color that's talking about right now, it's like after this election, y'all are gonna throw us away. These or organizations do not actually care. They're not going to care because um, they have never actually cared, but it's a publicity stunt at this point. So prove us wrong. The expectations are not high, but um, what can you do? That's what you should ask yourself. How can you decolonize music? How can you make a path wider for more black students, for more, um, for more students that um, are non-black POC, for more students who English is not their first language, for more students that are disabled, for more students that have mental health um, issues, for more students that have a broken home, for more students that don't have any strong economic background, you know, what can you do um, to make yourself decolonize and, act and be an activist in very intersectional ways? What can you do to take out the internalized white supremacy you have? And that goes for white men and that goes for white women that goes for white queer people that goes for white trans people that goes for whiteness overall all of you have internalized racism and it's time that you realize that your gender or sexuality does not take away from the internalized racism you have um or your racist history um so it's all of these things you need to ask yourself what can i do to make it better organize but do not center yourself do not ever find yourself saying well i did this today 
and blah, blah, blah. Unless you're kind of like, I took the steps here. This is how you do it. This is how I did it. Okay, cool. Boom, bam, let's do it. But don't make this as about you because it's never been about you. The only thing that's about you is how like you're actively destroying our life. And it's the way that this election, let's talk about it. This election should not be this damn close, but it just goes to show you that this man can go and do everything he did and white people are still supporting him. So that should just show you how much white supremacy is really, really rooted um, into this culture. So into this country, into the world, anti-blackness is global. global. Um, so it's always really good to remember those things. So that's what I leave you with today is to really ask yourself, what can I do to decolonize music? What can I do to make my neighborhood safer for black and brown, indigenous and non-black POC? What can I do to just truly alleviate the stress off of people that are melanated, especially black people? You know, what can I do? There has been a study that inflammation can cause you to die early. A lot of black people, when you experience racism, your body becomes inflamed which leads to a lot of black people dying of heart disease and heart attacks at like 65. So what can you do to make sure that shit don't happen no more? Um, so, cause decolonization should just not be on the backs of black people. Even though we have to often fix y'all's mistakes, make it not happen so much anymore. Let us be free. Let me just go to rehearsal and get the focus on whatever I have to play. Let me not have to think about, okay, I really have a problem right now with the person next to me, or I'm not really understanding what this conductor is saying and let me be able to raise my hand and be able to say what I need to say without being seen as aggressive, disruptive, ghetto, like all this shit. And let me be able to speak in AAVE, which I usually do. So um, yeah, fix it. You cause a problem, so fix it. So, and that's where I leave you on today. Be blessed. And if there are any questions, um, please drop them, I guess in the Q&A or the chat. I see a couple. Um, oh, for um, Julian, um, I was talking about Montana Roberts. And then, okay, and then the Q&A. Why do you, why do you think, oh, sorry, sorry. Why do you think that it is that? Even when white people want to make change de to decolonize, that it doesn't work, what can we do better or differently today? And you know why I can answer that? Because I'm getting paid. So um, essentially what you can do better is essentially what I was saying is um, do not send to yourself. Do not make your emotions get in the middle of this. If you fuck up, you can try to do the right thing and fuck up. That's why good intentions doesn't mean a good result. You can have good intentions and really hurt someone. Um, so it's really good to remember that. Make sure that you don't make it about you, that you're looking at the bigger picture, that when a really important thing, if you see someone in college, um, being racist or made a mistake or anything like that in someone's or did a microaggression, which is all rooted in racism. But, um, and they're like, oh, well, they're just young. They're 19, they're a kid, they're a boy um, or a girl or any of these things. And they kind of baby them. Just remember, always remember this, Tamir Rice was 12 years old, had a toy gun and was murdered. So that, remember that, remember these things. Um, and for Beth, um, what made me choose Bassoon as a young person? So I kind of have an interesting story with Bassoon. Um, I actually started Bassoon when I was 18. Um, I played saxophone and then um, I switched to Bassoon the summer before I started university. And I did um, Stephen F. Austin State University for a year. Uh, I went there and essentially learned bassoon over the summer, learned bassoon in a year, just kind of tried to fit seven years of bassoon playing into two semesters. And then I decided I do not want to go here anymore. And I saw what conservatory was and I think like, I can do that. Um, and it was really difficult, was really stressful, but I ended up getting into Peabody. So I decided to go there and I've been playing bassoon ever since. Um, and I would say if you um, want to keep in touch with me, um, you can follow me on the, the gram. And you can find me on Instagram at joe underscore away. And I put that into the chat. You can also go to my website um, and shoot me an email and we can continue this conversation. Um, but yeah, usually not for free, but um, yeah, we can always continue this conversation. Um, I do a lot of talks like this, but yeah, thank you so much for tuning in. And it's been a pleasure. I think, yeah, that's all the questions. I have, but it's been great. I would say, please, um, yeah, if you have time, come to the recital on Monday and just speak briefly about that. The recital um, is two pieces of mine and four pieces by my friends. Um, 
Olivia Short wrote this piece um, about Grace Jones. And it's essentially a very body positive piece. She gave me the space to make a script and improv on top of it. And it was a really beautiful time about um, self-love. The other piece, Edgar Guzman, is an electronic piece basically based off of the harmonics of low B flat and a drone. It's very fun. That's going to open the concert. It has so much energy. It is very difficult and I love it. I just love how much he pushes you to like kind of giving in an impossible piece in a way and the way like you can play it. But some of the techniques he asks is kind of hard to make it consistent. And you have to improv. You have to be on. You have to go with the flow, be in the moment. And I love when people teach me how to be in the moment more because that is one of the most difficult things to do in life. Um, and then Jesse Cox, one of my just really good friends, um, he wrote this piece for a solo bassoon based off of African rhythms, African folk songs. Um, and it straight up is one of the most intimidating pieces I've ever played. And he has walked with me every step of the way to just make this piece super accessible for me um, and not be so intimidated by the score. It's a very, very beautiful score. Um, but there's a lot going on in that score. And he really, really challenged me with this piece and also to live in the moment and to be free. And if like there's something coming up and you're like, okay, I don't know if we're going to get this out today to kind of just change in the moment and go with it. He is super okay of no performance of that is ever the same. So we played that. And then we also love to improv together because Jesse Cox is um, a composer and drummer. Olivia Short is a composer and saxophonist and um, very involved in theater and sound design and arts administration. And Edgar Guzman is a composer based in Mexico who um, is also a composer and writes a lot of experimental ex electronic work. Um, Olivia is based in Toronto and Jesse Cox goes to Columbia University in New York, but is currently residing in Sweden since Corona. But um, yeah, so it's all these pieces and me and Jesse love to improv together. So we took the themes of the solo piece and improv on top of it. And it was so, so, so fun while he was in Sweden. So technology. Um, the last few pieces are mine and one is a film called 219 AM. And it is a piece. Um, it's a film that me and my cousin Alex Broussard, um, who is a videographer, works at PBS and NPR in Houston, um, is just amazing. And we shot this film basically to represent all of the very tough things my body goes through when I'm in an episode and what I look like behind closed doors at 2.19 a.m. and just like kind of struggling, don't really know how to ask for help, don't really know how to reach out and all these things because it's been very known that if you tell someone like, oh, I feel suicidal today, people immediately freak out and want to call 911, they want to get you help, they want to do that. And it's like, no, can you just listen to me? A lot of people might be alive if they were allowed to express when they were suicidal um, and they were allowed to just speak about it. Because a lot of times from the people I've worked with um, when they're going through it for, and also myself, once you say like that very tough thing out loud, you're like, oh shit, hold up, no. <laughs> I kind of like breathing. Um, and it's, it was really fun. It's very challenging work. And it's um, a short film that we made and um, I wrote the music for and this singing and things like that. And it was really, really fun. Um, and the other piece I wrote is called How to Breathe While Dying. It is an ensemble piece and also a solo bassoon piece. Um, so it's two pre-recorded bassoons to start and me soloing or playing a trio with myself. Um, and then electronics and then like 12 bassoons at the end, 12 pre-recorded Joey's. Um, and it's really fun. And that piece is essentially about living with bipolar disorder um, and also being black in this country and also being non-binary and have to deal with so many different facets of issues in this world. Um, but also the beauty of my life, the beauty of being black, the beauty of being black and queer, the beauty of being black, queer and non-binary, you know, um, and having the freedom and the privilege to be an artist in this country, um, or just on earth in general. So with that, it's just a piece that has some very aggressive playing and moments of just like bliss and things like that. Cause it's like how to breathe while dying. How can I learn how to enjoy my life while dealing with all these other things and still validate the trauma I'm experiencing. It really going radical self-love, giving myself the tough love when I need and giving myself and my inner child the motherly care that I deserve. So um, yeah, that's going to be the recital. I think it's going to be really exciting. Uh, Monday at 7.30, um, it'll be a stream register. You can find the link on my bio on Instagram. It's also um, I think on Virginia Tech's information, but yeah, I am extremely happy to share this musical offering with each of you and thank you and be blessed.